Thousands of voices hold the stories that can teach us about a dark chapter in America's past. At the Densho Project, our mission is to preserve these memories before they fade away. The first Japanese began emigrating to the United States in the late 1800s. By 1940, Japanese Americans were more or less settled into American society. This all changed on December 7, 1941, when suddenly they looked like the enemy. And before my mother got home, the FBI showed up, and it must have been shortly after lunch. They came for my dad that night, early on the morning of December 8th. One of the teachers said, you people bomb Pearl Harbor, and I'm going, my people, you know. All of a sudden, my Japanese-ness became very aware to me. I was seen as a Jap, the same as the enemy. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor made America angry and afraid. As Japan's army and navy swept unchallenged through the Pacific, most Americans thought it perfectly reasonable to take action against their Japanese-American neighbors here at home. Even today, many Americans still don't know that more than 120,000 Japanese-Americans, two-thirds of them U.S. citizens, were forced from their homes and put behind barbed wire because of their race. Not until 1983, almost 40 years later, would a U.S. Congressional Commission uncover evidence from the war years proving there had been no military necessity for the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans. In 1997, there were two forces that really shaped Densho. The first one was that our elders in our community were dying. These were people who lived through World War II, and we needed to get their stories, so there's a sense of urgency. The second force was the emergence of high technology. Here we had digital video, the internet, and multimedia computers to really preserve these stories for the future. Even before the war, well, I felt... And when I think back eight years, I realize how far we've come. When we first started, we didn't know how to do interviews, so we had to train ourselves, train volunteers, and then we were ready. But what threw us for a loop was that when we started asking people to be interviewed, many of them said no. They said the stories were, were too painful. And so we had to tell them that the stories weren't for them, or really for my generation. They were for future generations. And that's what we're going to have to do the same thing where we're going to scan these. And that's why we call ourselves the Dential Project, because Dential means to pass stories on to the next generation. And our narrator said, you know, that's really why they're doing this. So once the community saw what we're doing, they saw the value of our work, and they want to support it. So right away, we started receiving checks, which allowed us then to continue doing more interviews and collect more photos and more documents. And so right now, just day by day doing this work, we've collected over 230 interviews. We've collected over 6,000 photographs and documents. And all this is now available uh, online on the internet. To make these unique materials widely available, Densho created a massive web database. With just a few clicks of a mouse, users anywhere in the world can see and hear entire interviews indexed by topic, complete with written transcripts, or they can sift through thousands of historic documents and rare photographs pulled from basements and closets, then scanned into the database. As a result, Densho's web archive is not only a comprehensive living history, but an unparalleled resource for understanding what happened to Japanese Americans. Every year, over 80,000 people come to our website, and they come from all over the world. But what really excites me is that most of them are students. 
And that's important because our mission at Densho is education. We're not about just preserving the past, we're about inspiring the future also. For anyone who didn't live through World War II, the idea that the American government would put its own citizens inside barbed wire camps might seem beyond belief, not possible. Well, do you know what they were allowed to take with them, what they were limited to? Any teacher in any classroom anywhere can take students back to 1942 and sit face to face with Americans who tell their own stories of what really happened. The first thing I pick is my mitts and my ball. The ability to see interviews and to see actual chronologies and hear people making actual speeches, whether they were for or against the detention, that's all very positive. When, when I see them talking about their experiences, it hits me much harder and I really feel like their presence and like their experience. The most important thing is really to have a first-hand experience from it, and you can't get that in a textbook no matter, you know, how hard you try, but to have someone actually tell you what happened, that's, I mean, that's priceless. In 1988, Congress passed and President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act. This law mandated monetary payments and formal apologies to all survivors of the incarceration. The lesson, of course, was clear. Anytime we single out a group because of how they look or what God they pray to, we undermine America's democracy. That happened during World War II, and it's happening again today. One of the beauties of the Constitution is that it's a, it's a document that applies really without exception. It's not to be applied when it's convenient. It's not to be applied uh, when it's easy. It's really to be applied when it's hard. It's at those times where you have to be least willing to throw away your constitutional rights and really hold yourself as a country to those constitutional rights. Was that the first time that you By bringing the lessons of the past into the Japanese present and the future, the Denjo World promotes War. critical thinking the, as well as compassion in, in, in the... and provides a vital perspective on the complex problems facing all of us today. During World War II, our country made a terrible mistake. We want people to understand this, not because we want to dwell upon the past, but we want people to make better, more informed decisions. I think it's really important that people know what happened. I mean, only I think when you really understand something and you really know why this happened and what we did, can you prevent it from happening again? How do you keep alive something as important as the internment experience and the lessons that we learn from it? Don't hesitate, but get out and speak up your, your feelings and let them know that you want justice. And so we take the mistakes of history and determine for ourselves that in our lifetime, it will happen never again. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Ikeda, and I'll be your MC this afternoon. The, the video you just saw shows you what Densho is doing to collect the stories of the Japanese American community. Uh, this morning, when I was uh, talking with my wife about what I should you know, talk about today, she also mentioned that I, sh I should talk about Densho's larger vision also, that the technology, the methods that we're working on and perfecting, our plan is to actually share that with many other communities beyond the Japanese American community because the essence of Densho is really sharing stories. And by sharing these stories, we truly believe that as, as a society, as, as a world, that we will learn to be closer and, and learn to work together. And so that overall is the mission of Densho. And, and my wife said, you know, make sure you tell people that it's much bigger than just the Japanese American community. But today on Veterans Day, one of the stories that we really want to share are the stories of our Japanese American World War II veterans. And to start the program, I'm going to have Commander Dale Kaku of the Seattle Nisei Veterans Committee 
to uh, lead us in the posting of the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Helping him will be Sergeant Christopher Ross, who's an active duty soldier who has already been deployed three times um, in support of the global war on terrorism. And he'll be uh, presenting the US flag. Presenting the Washington State flag would be Taro Yurida, a Vietnam War veteran. Presenting the Nisei Veterans Committee flag would be Joe Sasaki, a Korean War veteran. Presenting the 442nd Regimental Combat Team flag would be George Morihiro, a World War II veteran from the 442. And then presenting the Military Intelligence Service flag will be Art Urozu, also a World War II veteran. Thank you, Tom. I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, would you please uh, stand for the presentation of colors and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Post the colors. Present arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order arms. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. It is, uh, for me, so heartwarming and exciting to see so many here. We've been planning this event for about four or five months. But longer than four or five months, I've had an idea for doing this event for, for years. Because the, the men that you see on, this, on the stage are, are very special to me. I grew up in Seattle in the 50s and 60s. And um, as many of the you know, baby boomers uh, in Seattle, Japanese Americans, you know, we spent time at the, the MVC, the Nisei Veterans uh, Committee uh, Clubhouse. And one of my earliest memories is actually of Santa Claus at the uh, Christmas party. Because what I thought, it was, it was so cool to have a Santa Claus that not only knew your name and could, and could say it correctly, <laughs> but was, was Japanese American. But the thing that, that really was memorable for me was uh, it was something actually my, my older brother Dan uh, noticed. Uh, he noticed uh, after we had gone up and got our present that he looked at Santa Claus's shoes. And what he noticed was they were the exact same shoes as my Uncle Chuck's. <laughs> and so we, 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 at that point we figured out that, that Uncle Chuck was, was Santa Claus. And, and that just gives you a, a flavor of, in some ways, growing up in the, uh, in the community as, as a third generation Sansei baby boomer, um, that these men here were, were there. And I knew them really as sort of the dads and uncles of, of my friends and really didn't know their stories. It, it wasn't until just recently, just in the last eight, nine years, when I started doing Den Show, that um, you know, as a middle-aged you know, baby boomer, I started actually talking you know, to these men. And you know, I didn't really know their stories, but what, what they started telling me about was that you know, during the war, within months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you know, their, their families were removed and they were sent to these camps. And then uh, from these camps, um, you know, here's a picture of the Higo uh, Variety Store on Jackson Street that was boarded up, and that these were um, you know, the Seattle Japan town became a ghost town. Over 120,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast were sent to camps in isolated wastelands in the interior of the United States. And it was from out of these camps that many of these men were asked to volunteer. During one of my interviews, uh, this was oh, about six, seven years ago, I had the, uh, the pleasure and opportunity to interview Mas Watanabe. And he was one of the volunteers. And one of the questions I asked him was, why, what was he thinking when he was being asked to volunteer? Well, initially I was wondering, what the hell is this, you know? But um, I think uh, those of us who did uh, react to it uh, 
positively, I think we did the right thing. And uh, to this day, is, well, regardless of uh, what people think, I think we did the right thing in volunteering after being kicked in the butt. Why do you think so? I mean, what, 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 what makes you think that that was the right thing to do? Because, gee, uh, if you're going to live here or, you know, uh, you've got to be a part of society. You've got to do what uh, is expected of you. And uh, I had no problem volunteering. I don't know which was worse, uh, being locked up in camp or going off to war. In my mind, uh, barbed waters aren't very, uh, very inviting. So that was just a snippet of one of the interviews I've, I've done in the last eight years. And in the next 10 minutes, I may just show you uh, more of those clips from some of the veterans I did. But Moss and the other volunteers went down to Mississippi to do uh, their basic training to learn to become soldiers. And I just have some numbers in terms of, of who these men were. Uh, your average age was 21, and your average IQ was 116, which was eight points higher than necessary to become an officer in the Army. Your average weight, this was the one that was, was most interesting to me, was only 120 pounds also. The, the other thing that was um, interesting talking to the men, and most of the men I talked with came from the uh, western uh, side of the state of Washington and the western side of Oregon, and they were very different than some of the veterans I, I spoke with uh, that came from Hawaii, because the, the volunteers from Hawaii had a very different experience from those that came from the camps. The, and, and to give you a sense of this, I'll, I'll share again some numbers. The, um, when the Army decided to allow volunteers uh, from the Japanese American community, what they thought was, well, the population of Japanese Americans in Hawaii is actually similar to the, the level of population on the west coast of the United States. The big difference, though, was that the Japanese Americans in Hawaii were not incarcerated. They weren't put in camps. They were uh, left to stay in their homes and, and to participate in society, whereas the men in uh, the West Coast had to go to camps. Well, it was interesting. So when the Army went and asked for volunteers, what they expected was, uh, well, we want 3,000 from Hawaii and 3,000 from the West Coast who were now in camps, so 3,000 from the camps. And because Hawaii already had about 1,500 in the 100th Battalion, they expected about 1,500 from Hawaii uh, more to, be, to volunteer with 3,000 from the camps. In actuality, what happened was that over 10,000 from Hawaii volunteered, that they really wanted to support the war effort. On the other hand, coming from those desolate conditions in the camps, only 1,250. And I thought that was interesting just from a, from a perspective of of the differences when you, when you um, treat men uh, with respect, how much more willing they are to, to fight for our country. But what was interesting um, also was the, the culture clash. Because not only were these experiences very different, but they were very different men. And one of the things that came up oftentimes in, in my interviews was how the language was different. And so here we're gonna have um, Tosh Yasutake talk a little bit about his first experience talking with a uh, Hawaiian. And he said, you go, go to P PX, you go get come. And I said, what? And he <laughs> looked at me, I said, you go get come. And I said, you want me to go to PX? And he said, yeah. <laughs> he got very upset with me. And the one of the mainland guys told me, if we want you to go and get some p potato chips on PX and bring it back. He had given me $20 to do that. <laughs> so I had to ask the direction how to get there, and I went there and got and brought it back. But that was my first exposure to Pigeon English. So I love those stories. The, after basic training um, at, at Camp Shelby in Mississippi, many of them uh, joined the 442 or formed the 442 to fight in Europe. And I don't have the time to really go into the details of the, of the campaigns, but um, they pretty much, they, they fought primarily in Italy and in, uh, in France. And uh, one story I want to tell about was the, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a famous uh, battle, it's, it's the rescue of the Lost Battalion. And after the liberation of Briers, uh, there was a, a, a situation where 
a, a group of Texans, uh, a battalion of Texans, about uh, 211, were completely surrounded by the Germans. And they were surrounded uh, for days. And during lunch today, I was actually talking to uh, Sandra Inoue about this. And they knew, the, the men of 442 knew this was a, a very dire and, and serious um, situation because other groups had gone in trying to save these uh, 211 Texans, but no one could break through. And in fact, what the Sanders shared with me today, which I didn't know, was the men openly talked uh, about that, that they, were, they viewed themselves, or they knew that they were viewed as expendable, that because the others couldn't do this, they felt that, well, we'll use the 442 because they are expendable, but they'll go through. And even though the men knew this, they, they said they were going to rescue these men, that more than anything, that they knew that if they could do this, it would show the United States you know, how, much, you know, how, how loyal they were. And so the, the, the clip I'm going to show you isn't so much about the battle itself. The, 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 the more powerful clip to me was what happened right after the battle. Because after the 442 went in there and they did rescue those 211 men, they suffered over 800 casualties to save those 211 men. And in the process, you know, there, there were companies with just you know, a few men left standing. But after the battle, the general, General Dahlquist, wanted to address the troops and have them assemble in front of him. And in doing so, he wanted to, to um, you know, salute them as they walked by. And here we're going to have a, a clip where Rudy Tokiwa talks about you know, what happened. So General Dahlquist turned around and he said to the colonel, when I order everyone to pass in review, I mean the cooks and everybody will pass in review. And Chaplain Yamada said, this is the first time I saw the colonel cry. And he said, this is all I have left. Can you imagine the feeling he must have had to think that he had to order people to go out and get killed when it was these people that put the families into concentration camp and they're still there. Because what you would, uh, the, the 442 at full strength was about 4,000. What they saw that day was a, a group of only about 1,000 men left. And, and so that's what the, the general saw. So he thought that men had gone off on leave and didn't realize that, that so many had, had, had been wounded or killed. The, the 442 is, is known as, uh, for, the, for the length of service and its size, the most highly decorated unit in U.S. Army history. The primary reason for that is the number of Purple Hearts. That all, at full strength, they're 4,000. They had to be replaced about three and a half times to, to keep them going. But they had over 9,000 Purple Hearts for that, for that group. In addition, they had eight presidential citations. And, the, the, and, and to sort of end the story on the, the 442, because there's a lot more, and I want uh, uh, the senator to, to talk more about this, I just want to read a quote that, that President Truman um, uh, said on the lawn of the White House after the 442 returned to the United States. And he said, you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you won. You have made the Constitution stand for what it really means, the welfare of all the people all the time. At the same time the 442 was fighting in Europe, there was um, another group in the Pacific. And, and I never had heard about these people until about, oh, about 12 years ago, because they were a, a secret army unit, the Military Intelligence Service. And there were about 6,000 men who were trained to, uh, because of their Japanese language schools, to be interpreters, to, uh, to uh, translate Japanese documents, to interrogate soldiers. And they were very strategic because, if you can imagine, they were the eyes and ears with intelligence as well as with uh, their ability with their, their Japanese language. And the, the ironic thing, though, about this is when you think about why Japanese Americans were put in camps, it was because they weren't trusted. And intelligence 
the U.S. intelligence said, and the ones that you can't trust are those who were actually the ones who had training in Japan because they knew the language better, but then their loyalties couldn't be trusted. When the ironic thing is, in the MIS, it was those men who were actually trained in Japan and then came back to the United States, they were the most valuable ones. And here we have uh, Mas uh, Fukuhara talking about that. I don't know how much you know about the MIS, but uh, the, in most of uh, their applica practical applications, the, the, uh, the real linguists in MIS were guys educated in Japan. They were Kibes. And um, that's kind of ironic because, geez, uh, you know, uh, DeWitt went on for a half a page justifying the evacuation of Japanese. One, one of the things that he pointed out was really that, that, these, uh, that these Nisei were, um, um, you know, uh, couldn't be trusted because, geez, I mean, they had all this knowledge of Japanese and Japanese culture. And, uh, and Kibes were the worst of all because, you know, they were educated in Japan. So again, because of their Japanese language school or training and because of their background, they translated documents, broke secret codes, questioned and interrogated prisoners, again, providing the eyes and ears for the intelligence. But they were also assigned out in the field. And I, I want to tell one story. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to, to interview one of the men in the MIS who was actually out in the field. And he was assigned with Merrill's Marauders in the uh, jungles of Burma. And uh, the, the gentleman I'm talking about is Roy Matsumoto. And it, it was a fascinating story, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to this significant battle, uh, the Battle of Napunga, where Roy's unit, and this was a, a US unit in the, in the jungles of Burma, they were completely surrounded by the Japanese army. And uh, they were in the jungle, so there's no one there that was going to really come in and, and save them. In fact, Roy said that when you're in the jungle, there's really a no prisoner sort of mentality. That even if you, if you had a prisoner, you really couldn't bring them out because you were so deep in the jungle. And so Roy's unit of 200 men were surrounded. And it's been surrounded for over 10 days. They're out of water. They're low on ammunition. And uh, things are incredibly dire. Um, uh, in fact, uh, you know, something that uh, he shared with me was how, um, at this point, some of the men, they said, prayed to ABC. I, I remember this in, you know, a particular statement. I said, Roy, what's ABC? And he said, you know, they prayed to Allah, Buddha, and Christ. And because at this point, they said they had no hope for, for many of these. But R R Roy did something extraordinary. Uh, in the dead of the night, he crawled down um, uh, across the line down to the, uh, the Japanese camp uh, to see if he could hear anything uh, in terms of what the plans were for the Japanese. And what he overheard was that the Japanese were planning a frontal attack on the unit. They, they, they decided where the most vulnerable place um, to attack, and they figured that the, the Americans at this point were, were weakened. So this was their, their moment, that they were going to do a, a bonsai charge um, at this one, uh, this one hill. And so Roy um, uh, went back and uh, informed the, uh, the camp what was going on. And so what they were able to do was, was to set a trap that where they, uh, the Japanese thought the uh, front would be, they actually booby-trapped the, uh, the foxholes. And then the Americans brought all their, all their submachine guns, all their automatics, and, and set them right there waiting. And, um, and then as morning um, came, um, as expected, the Japanese uh, sent a wave of about 30 men as a first uh, frontal attack. And they quickly got to those foxholes and, uh, and they stopped because they were confused. There was no one there and they were waiting. Um, and then uh, they, they were shooting and there was some gunshots, but they hesitated. And at that point, um, they realized that the Japanese would probably retreat at that point. And again, without any orders or anything, Roy did something extraordinary. And I want to show this on, on the next clip, what he did. You know, all the things. And what, what gave you the idea to do this? Well, I, I mean, that I don't want them to retreat, you know. I want them to get killed because we have machine gun waiting there. 
So what he did, because Roy, Roy had this, this Japanese uh, uh, language training, so what he did was he ordered in Japanese the soldiers to, to keep going forward. And so that way the, the trap work, um, that was significant because what happened because of that battle, the Japanese suffered enough casualties that they then retreated uh, and the unit then was able to, to, um, to leave. And so to this day, the, the men there, those 200 men, all uh, you know, credit their lives to, to Roy Matsumoto, who happens to be on stage today also. And, and this is a picture of, of General Merrow uh, giving an award to Roy for that, for that action. In addition to the, the wartime efforts, the MIS, uh, the men of the MIS, also played this huge role in the, uh, during the occupation. Because again, with their language skills, they could help the U.S. in terms of the occupation of Japan, but also they helped during the, the war uh, crimes trial. When these men returned, not only the, the men of the MIS, but the 442, you know, some were greeted in celebration, but the return wasn't always positive. Um, next I have uh, here Rick Sato, who talks about returning to Wapato, Washington. Now tell me what happened when you came back to Wapato. Well, one disappointment I had is I had a discharge. I just got discharged and I wanted to go get a haircut there. And they, they said, we don't cut Jap's hair. And that was a worse feeling for me all that time. That must have felt terrible. Yeah, it felt really terrible. I mean, I thought, what was did I go in the service for? And to me, this this is the part where where um, it strikes me the most in terms of the the heroism of the the men on the stage, because not only did they return to the retail, the realities of racism, but they returned to a Japanese American community that was devastated. It was in shambles. I mean, you have to realize that communities like Seattle were completely removed, and then they had to come back with nothing to start with. And so the heroic thing for me was that these men you know, helped rebuild the Japanese American community. And they didn't complain about things. They, you know, I know these men. They're, they're, they're quiet, they're humble, and, and they just worked to, to rebuild our community. They, they built a, a clubhouse. They, they coached youth sports, and not just Japanese Americans, but they, I think on purpose, realized that Japanese Americans needed to reach out to other communities. They held public events, and they, they tried to regain some semblance of normalcy for our community. And the other big thing that I think they did more than you know, perhaps any other group is they helped change perceptions. You know, through their presence, they were able to meet and get to know people who before the war were actually against the Japanese and were for the internment, people like Scoop Jackson. Whereas after the war, Scoop became one of our best friends. And again, I, I attribute that a lot to the veterans. And so at this point, I'm gonna end right now by just, um, because we have other speakers, but just to say how thankful I am to the men on the stage, not just for their efforts for the war, but for what they have done for the Japanese American community. Thank you. To introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Rudy, can we have you come up? Uh, Rudy DeLeon, a senior vice president of the Boeing Company, will do the, uh, the next introduction. Uh, Rudy DeLeon is um, a senior vice president, again, at Boeing. And Boeing is one of the uh, prime sponsors of this event. And the reason I asked Rudy to do this introduction is he was the deputy uh, uh, secretary of defense uh, at the same time that General Myers was uh, the vice chair, so I thought it would be a perfect person to do the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for the introduction. And on this Veterans Day 2005, it's an honor for Boeing to be a sponsor of this event. We are in the presence of extraordinary men who have accomplished extraordinary things for America and our history. So, in particular, on behalf of the 160,000 employees of Boeing, uh, we want to acknowledge all that you have done for our country on this Veterans Day. So thank you very much.
It is also an honor for me to have the chance to introduce a man who is actually celebrating his first Veterans Day because for 40 years he wore the uniform of the United States Air Force and served with great distinction and I had a chance to serve with him in the Pentagon. You know him as the 15th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I know him as a friend, a trusted colleague, and a man of unquestioned integrity. General Dick Myers began his service to our country upon graduation from Kansas State University where he earned a degree in engineering and a commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force ROTC. Now with General Myers today, and I also need to acknowledge her, is someone who shared that 40 years of service to the United States, and that is Mary Jo Myers. General Myers wears the wings of a command pilot with over 4,000 flying hours, including 600 combat hours in the F-4 Phantom over Vietnam. That means he's a fighter pilot, a part of a very special breed. A few moments ago, I asked him in all of years of flying, who was the greatest pilot he ever saw? Without missing a beat, his answer was, Rudy, you're about to introduce him. Throughout his career, General Myers has held a number of important command positions, including U.S. forces in Japan and then later the Pacific Air Force. And also, he commanded U.S. First US Space Command. As the 15th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he led the U.S. military's efforts in the global war on terrorism while ensuring that all U.S. forces are well prepared to meet future threats. As chairman, he was known for fostering positive military-to-military -military relations with our partners and allies, for being a tireless advocate of the men and women in uniform, and being, again, a spokesperson for common sense in Washington, D.C. Just two days ago, in recognition of his many contributions to our nation, the President of the United States awarded General Myers with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That means we have a Medal of Freedom recipient with us today, and a Medal of Honor recipient with us today, Senator Inouye. So it is my privilege, ladies and gentlemen, with great respect to introduce to you General Richard Myers. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a delight to be here, uh, Senator Inouye and, uh, and, and Governor and all our other distinguished veterans and distinguished members in the audience. Um, Mr. De Leon got it wrong in just one aspect. I never claim to be the world's greatest pilot or fighter pilot. Um, I do claim to be, before I retired, the oldest pilot. <laughs> and uh, until I retired about five or six weeks ago, I was still flying actively. And in fact, even after retirement, I went back to Hawaii for a week of um, relaxation, Mary Jo and I did, and was invited by the Hawaii uh, Air National Guard to fly in the F-15 one more time as a civilian with them. Uh, the guy that took me up was a, was a fellow named, his, his call sign was Mongo, um, not particularly distinguished, but a Japanese American heritage, by the way, his real name was Sakai, and uh, we had a wonderful flight, and it's always good to look down on, on the beautiful waters of Hawaii. So I claim to be the oldest, not the best. Um, let me tell you why I'm here. I got an email from a very good friend of mine, Yuzo Tokita. Yuzo and I started uh, our Air Force careers pretty much at the same time. And after pilot training, we joined up in Germany at an F-4 unit. And it started a 40-year relationship of which we spent a lot of time together. And one of the first things I learned from, from Yuzo was the internment story and of his family here in Seattle and how they were interned in Idaho. And it, um, I mean, it was such an incredible story of which if I knew anything at all, I didn't know very much. I mean, it, it, I don't think I was consciously aware of this chapter in, in our U.S. history. So it was, it was a wonderful introduction to a wonderful community. Now the relationship has, uh, has prospered and he emailed me and he said, 
would you mind, uh, uh, Tom Akeda and others said, would you mind coming out here? And I, I said, well, for the first Veterans Day, as a veteran, not as somebody wearing the uniform, I can't think of a place that I'd rather be than in Seattle, Washington, with these great men. And I thank you for the opportunity. I also had the chance to speak to a, I think it was one of the reunions of the 442nd and the 100th, and probably also the Military Intelligence Service in Honolulu about seven years ago when I was the commander of Pacific Air Forces. And what that forced me to do was get into the history of this unit. And so uh, as I prepared to speak to him, I got into the history I read, and then I listened to stories. And then I found out that my very humble, a very humble man, the barber in headquarters Pacific Air Forces at Hickam Air Force Base, a building that was strafed by the Japanese on December 7, 1941, that the barber was a member of the 442nd. Fred was an artillery spotter, but you didn't know this unless you, unless you knew the history, unless you kind of pried it out of Fred to find out how he went through Italy and through, through France and, and the deeds that, uh, that he did. Um, so that piqued my interest as well. And then, of course, I served for two of my four years as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with a fellow named uh, Rick Shinseki. Rick Shinseki was chief of staff of the Army, as you know, from Hawaii, uh, great Japanese-American patriot, and uh, that also piqued my interest. And then of my 40-year career, I spent uh, almost six years of that in Japan. Uh, we had two daughters born in Okinawa and then later went back as commander, U.S. Forces Japan, uh, located just outside Tokyo in the mid-90s. Let me tell you one small story from that time, and it's really my wife's story because I was not present, but, uh, but I know this story very well because it's, it's one that it moved us greatly. Um, we were uh, having a Japanese student o uh, on an exchange. An exchange meant they came over for a day and a night and, and spent with you uh, military service members there in, in Japan. And when our student showed up at the door, so did his father and his mother. And his father was carrying a, a little box. And uh, Mary Jo wondered, I wonder what's in that little box. And uh, as they sat down and started the discussions, uh, the father of the student said uh, in Japanese, because he didn't know English, he said, I, you know, I, I, uh, and we didn't know Japanese well enough to understand, him, so, but we had an interpreter, so we worked all through that. He said, I want to show you something uh, that I have made. And I got this, he said, I got respect for Americans from my father, who always wished he had a chance to thank uh, the Americans after World War II, and never had a chance to do it. He said, so I've built this little box. And with that, he took the, the cover off, and inside he had built a little music box that played the Star Spangled Banner. And how he put this all together with his own hands, we'll never know. And then he commenced to play it. Uh, our our time in Japan was so rich and rewarding is another reason that we're here. We had a, a wonderful time, and, uh, and we hope that relationship will go on. I, I understand uh, uh, we have the Council General from Japan here as well, I think, has been acknowledged already, and his uh, lovely wife. So that's, that's why I'm here. I, this, is, uh, this is something that I think is very important to me, and when I found out about Tom Ikeda and, and Densho, I thought there is not a more important project that's going on right now than to try to capture, to capture these lessons. There are great stories of patriotism, of honor, of courage, and of, of, of service. And some of those Tom went through in the pictures, and they are terrific. Um, Tom said, I, I would like you to read up on the military intelligence service before you come out. And we did that, and one of the stories, of course, is Roy uh, Matsumoto's story, um, and there are others. And what it reminds me of is in our activities in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, there's always segments of the military that are less well-known and that are absolutely essential to victory. And because of their operations being either so sensitive uh, or so secret or that if you reveal the nature of them, you would jeopardize uh, American lives, that the stories aren't told right away. We have those units today. Uh, we had them in World War II. And I'm glad today, because it's something I didn't know when I was in Honolulu speaking to this group, about the military intelligence service and the bravery of uh, Japanese Americans who would, as Roy did, go behind enemy lines many times at great personal risk and provide that essential intelligence that could make the difference between life and death on the battlefield. 
So my hat's off to the military intelligence service and the way you have served and to the rest of the 442nd. The, the, stories, the stories go on and on. Uh, but I was reminded by what uh, Senator Inouye said that the stories aren't important by themselves. The lesson really is that patriotism and love of our great country are not limited to any ethnic group. And wartime hysteria must never again lead us to trample on our democratic principles. Uh, very profound, very profound words. There is no way that uh, any of our veterans, but particularly our veterans here on this stage, can be repaid for what they have, have done. But what we can do is ensure that our great democracy continues to learn and adapt and understand the lessons of the past, as Tom said, so we don't repeat mistakes that we made in the past. I, I wish I could beam down on this stage, by the way, to take it to the future now, or to today and to the future. If I wish I could beam down the men and women who are in uniform today who are serving. We have some on the front row. I haven't had a chance to meet them yet. Um, we have got great Americans serving this country all over the globe and doing terrific work. One of the last things I did in office was to take a USO tour with some USO entertainers and went all around the world. We went 25,000 miles. We met about 15,000 uh, troops and we did it in 10 days. And what you find out is that our people that are deployed uh, understand what the mission is, understand the seriousness of the threat of global terrorism, are willing, as these gentlemen were, to sacrifice uh, themselves uh, to make us safer and to understand that there's more to their mission than just doing their mission. Most of them are involved in, in orphanages or improving medical clinics or helping with schools all over the world, but in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, the day job in Iraq is tough enough, but most of the people I met would talk about uh, what else they're doing for the Iraqi people because they have respect for them and they want to give them the same hope that we, that these gentlemen gave to us and to our, to our friends in, in Japan and to, and to Europe. Um, the other thing, and, the, and, and Tom Akeda talked about the, uh, uh, President Truman's quote where it's not only did you have to fight the enemy, but you had to fight prejudice as well, and you won. That's important, and it probably has a lot to do with why Dick Meyer stayed in uniform for 40 years. One of the things I'm proudest of of our military is our, our high standards, our ethical standards, and the fact that we do not tolerate discrimination. And it wasn't always that way. And part of that legacy is your legacy. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that, because it's, a, it's an organization you can be proud to be part of, our U.S. military, but it wasn't always the way it is today, and you all had a lot to do with making it the way it is today, enabling us to serve in a way that we're proud of, and I think America is, 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 uh, is proud of us. If we go back to the, the year 1776, how many have read David McCullough's book, 1776? I... I love it, and I, I don't know particularly why I love it other than he did come and speak to the joint staff. We had him to an off-site, and he's a great historian. He's a very eloquent speaker, and he talked about that year, 1776. If you haven't read it, you ought to read the book, 1776, because it was, a, it was not a particularly good year for this fledgling country of ours. In fact, in terms of military victories, until the very end of the year, uh, there weren't any victories. And it was, it was defeat. And we went with, uh, from an army of tens of thousands to an army of 3,000 by the winter of 1776, even though the Declaration of Independence was, was signed in, in July of 1776. And the Treaty of Paris didn't, I think it was seven and a half years beyond that. So there was a lot of work to do. And what it taught us, though, that while the Declaration of Independence is a great document, while our Constitution and Bill of Rights are great documents, uh, if you don't have people that are willing to support them, and people in uniform are part of those people that have to support them, then they're just interesting pieces of, of paper. And that perseverance is important. And I think all those traits that we found of the, in the men who served in the Continental Ar Army of 1776 are found right here. Uh, uh, people who uh, had to fight prejudice and the enemy, who won, who won for all of us, and we are a much greater nation because of it. 
So my hats are off to you. I am delighted to be in Seattle on this Veterans Day, my first Veterans Day as a veteran, and uh, it feels actually pretty good. And, um, and the last comment is this Densho project is extremely important. And I look to going uh, online uh, once I get the internet hooked up in my house, which is another story because we've not finished moving yet. But once I get online and to learning uh, more of the stories which are so precious to our heritage, uh, to everybody that lives in this country and calls himself an American, to all our heritage. And so I thank you, gentlemen, and it's an honor to be on this same stage with you. Thank you. Thank you, General Myers. Please, another round of applause. Thank you. One of the joys of doing this, this uh, event was actually getting to know General Myers and his wife, uh, Mary Jo, just the, the two most wonderful people. And so thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed it. The next uh, person that we have coming up is the governor of the state of Washington, which I'm very excited about. And uh, Governor Gregoire, if you could come up. Um, and as she's coming up, I just want to say this is my first chance to meet her. <laughs> and how it's such a pleasure that we could share this day with, with the governor. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I am uh, truly proud to join all of you today to honor the service of our, our veterans. What a special day for you, General Myers, and Mary Jo, to share your first Veterans Day with us. And it is always, 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 Senator, uh, a delight to have you come back to your second home state, that state of Washington. Um, Uh, Mike, uh, my husband, uh, a Viet Vietnam veteran, celebrating his uh, Veterans Day today as well, uh, is joining me today to honor all veterans uh, throughout the state of Washington, and most particularly those veterans here on the stage. And thanks to all of you for coming to say your appreciation and your thanks and honor these veterans. Well, it was uh, 87 years ago today, on the 11th hour, of the 11th day of the 11th month that we ended World War I with the slogan, it was the war to end all wars. But sadly, war itself did not end with World War I. And since that day so long ago, our soldiers have answered the call to serve us again and again. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, Iraq. Today we come together in solemn pride to recognize the heroism of those who have served our country. Both in times of war and peace, our veterans have served with courage, with commitment, and with devotion. And the legacy that they leave all of us is that great country in which we live. We truly recognize those who have given the ultimate sacrifice and died for us to have our freedom, but we also reflect on the service and the sacrifice of everyone who is with us here today. I want to thank all of our veterans for their service. Our nation and our state are grateful. Right now, here in Washington State, we are truly blessed. We have over 670,000 veterans living here, the 13th most in the nation. And today, 663 soldiers from Washington State are currently serving our country overseas, including 223 in Iraq. Their service is a continuation of a long and proud history, and their sacrifice should never be far from our thoughts and our prayers. They come from all ethnic backgrounds and all religions, but they also all come with a common purpose, and that is to defend our country and to ensure our freedom. These individuals here on this stage faced discrimination at home, but nonetheless, they answered the call of duty to protect our freedom. Today, I am proud to join you in paying special tribute to these courageous Japanese Americans who, despite what was going on at home, 
nonetheless chose to serve for our country in World War II. I am proud to be in the presence of so many veterans, from these veterans and their families who stood behind them as they served. I want to thank Scott Oakey and Tom Ikeda of the Densho Project for their preserving of the legacy that was left by these soldiers and their families, and to honor that legacy by promoting equality, justice, and freedom through the telling of their many stories. And I want to recognize the outstanding accomplishments of the Seattle Nisei Veterans Committee. You have served our country abroad with distinction, and now you're serving our communities here at home with similar distinction. My friends, I am truly honored today uh, to be the one to introduce our very special guest. He is the senior senator from the state of Hawaii, the Honorable Dania Enoe. He is an individual who has served his country with distinction in a number of ways. He enlisted in 1943 and the U.S. Army's 442nd Regiment Combat Team, as you heard earlier, the famed Go For Broke Regiment. And he truly epitomized that slogan. It was the fall of 1944, and you heard the story, and it was his unit that spent two weeks rescuing that Texas battalion. That has gone down in the annals of Army history as the Lost Battalion. And there, there was significant loss of life and the saving of those in that battalion. But main, and meanwhile, later, the 442 was called back to Italy in the closing months of the war, where they were assaulting a heavily defended hill. And then Lieutenant Enoway was first wounded, having been hit in the abdomen. But without failing, he continued, continued to lead his platoon, advancing himself alone against a machine gun nest, which had his men pinned down. He then took a dramatic shot in the right arm. It was shattered by a rifle grenade. He continued to defend his, his military. He was then hit in the leg. This individual was wounded dramatically in that battle. He came home as a captain, Captain Enoway, returning with a distinguished service cross, a bronze star, a purple heart with cluster, and 12 other medals and citations. He was truly honored. We were most of all, however, on June 21, 2000, when he was awarded the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest award for military valor by the President of the United States. He was, when he came home, he couldn't leave the call for service. He decided he would serve his great state, the state of Hawaii. So he served in the State House, and then he was distinguishedly elected as the first congressman in 1959 from the state of Hawaii. And then later in 1962, as United States Senator. He currently is serving in his seventh consecutive term as a United States Senator. He truly has a distinguished military career. He has served his state and his country as a distinguished U.S. Senator. I can tell you without exception, he is a true friend to the six million citizens of the great state of Washington. And so it is with great pleasure I welcome him home to his second state and ask you to address us today, Senator Anaway. Madam Governor, General Myers, my fellow veterans, my fellow Americans, ladies and gentlemen. Today we observe the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II. And during that time, nearly 25,000 Japanese Americans put on the uniform of this nation. 
And all of us have our stories to tell. We interpret the events, the words we hear, and the sights we see a little differently. And I've been asked to share with you my story. My story begins in a little village called Yokoyama, in the district of Yame, in the prefecture of Fukuoka. In July of 19, 1899, there was a fire in the village. Three residences were demolished, and that morning the village elders gathered and determined that the fire began in the home of my great-grandfather. He had a choice to make. He could pay the debt, or he could sneak out of the village, or stay there and refuse to pay the debt. The only honorable way was to pay the debt. And so he summoned his first son, the eldest, my grandfather, and directed him to take his wife and his firstborn, my father, to Yokohama to meet with the recruiter from a place called Hawaii to work in the plantations. And so they traveled from Fukuoka, from the south of Japan, and nearly walked all the way to Yokohama. There he signed on, and after 30 days on the high seas, arrived in Hawaii. He signed a contract to work for $12.50 a month for 60 hours a week. My grandmother for the same work, $7.50 a month. That was the beginning. There were thousands of others, their grandparents, their great-grandparents who left their villages painfully to travel to the mainland or to Hawaii. Their stories are also unique. However, in 1924, the Congress of the United States and the President of the United States enacted a law to exclude Japanese from immigrating to the United States. There were no laws for the French or the British, but the Japanese were not permitted to immigrate. And furthermore, they added something, a provision that said those who were in the United States as immigrants from Japan could not be naturalized. My father was a child of three and he spent most of his life in Hawaii, but he could not be naturalized until 1953. Then, on December the 7th, the tragedy occurred in Pearl Harbor. Soon thereafter, the government of the United States determined that all Japanese, including citizens, were to be declared as enemy aliens. All of us were enemy aliens. We could not serve in the uniform of our nation. We could not be drafted. We were just enemy aliens. And then soon thereafter, an executive order was issued, 9066 establishing 10 camps. And these camps in government documents were referred to as concentration camps to house 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans living on the west coast of the United States. That is the beginning of the story. Well, we petitioned the government of the United States to give us an opportunity to serve 
to demonstrate that we're just as good as anyone else. And finally, the President of the United States issued another executive order in which he declared that Americanism is a matter of mind and heart. Americanism is not and has never been a matter of race or color and declared the formation of the combat team with the number 442. They asked for volunteers. In Hawaii, over 80% of the eligible men volunteered. I was then 18 years old and I volunteered. To the chagrin of some of my friends because I was the eldest son in my family. But nevertheless, the first thing that I heard from my father, and it has always been with me, was when he escorted me to the recruiting station where trucks were waiting to take us to Schofield Barracks. He didn't say a word in the streetcar until we finally got to the destination. He looked at me and he said, this country has been good to us. Whatever you do, do not dishonor this country and do not dishonor the family. If you must die, die with honor. You know, those were profound words. I have always thought to myself, would I be able to say that to my son? Die with honor. But for my father, it was very important. Well, on the day of the departure, something strange happened. We were hoping that we could march down the boulevard to the ship proudly, heads up high. But for some reason, the military insisted that those of us who volunteered would have to carry our bags. And our parents were lined up along the highway to say goodbye to us and a whole string of military police between us. And you could hear in the distance parents calling their sons, Masao, Takashi. And ever so often some old lady or old man would try to dash across the street to say goodbye. Then the MPs would push them away. I always thought of that scene. It was demeaning and somehow not right because we looked like a bunch of POWs when we should have left Hawaii in grand style because many of them never got back. Well, we got on the ship, and like all men, we were looking forward with some anxiety, but we had no idea where we were headed for. When we landed in Oakland, the word filtered to us that we were headed for Mississippi. And the only thing that many of us could think of was Mississippi, that's where they lynch people. Well, they put us on trains, and because we looked like POWs, the train never stopped during the day. All of the stopping was done at night to stretch our legs. But when we got to Mississippi, we had the surprise of our lifetime. We were greeted by Red Cross ladies, and all were white women. In Hawaii, I can't think of a single restaurant that had a white waitress. All the service was done by Chinese or Japanese or Filipinos, and to have a white woman serve you coffee, it was a special treat. <laughs> and then they opened their doors to us, opened their farms, 
But then we received the letter from the governor of Mississippi, and the company commanders of the regiment were directed and ordered to read that letter to the men. So on one Saturday, all the men of the regiment assembled at the company areas, and the letter was read by the company commander. And it said, welcome to Mississippi. While you are here, we are pleased to tell you that we will treat you as white men. Conduct yourself accordingly. <laughs> that meant we could not sit in the last three rows of the bus. And as you can imagine, after a busy night at the bar in Mississippi, you get a bit tired. And so you sit in the last three rows and the bus driver would stop his bus and not move forward. That's when we saw the cruel aspect of discrimination. And there was another scene that I can never forget. I'm an old YMCA man, Young Men's Christian Association. I have a life membership and so I decided to visit the YMCA to do a little swimming. And I noticed that there were no African Americans. And so I innocently inquired. I said, uh, where are the Negroes? And this fellow looked at me and said, are you a troublemaker? Then I realized that the word C, the letter C, meant very little. It meant something other than Christian. Well, training was what one might expect. We trained very hard. But as alluded to by one of the films here, the Hawaiians had their own language. And the mainlanders were fair of skin. They spoke the king's language. <laughs> and they were very polite. And they would sometimes laugh and snicker when they heard us speak our language. And that led, unfortunately, to fistfights. Got so bad that our senior officers of the regiment at that point seriously decided to disband the regiment. Their argument was how can they go to war if they can't even relate to each other? They tried everything. I recall going to discussion groups, social hours, nothing worked until one day each company received 10 invitations from a place called Roa and a place called Jerome. And we didn't sense it at that moment, but the invitations were issued only to the Hawaii soldiers. And we thought they were Japanese communities in Jerome, Arkansas, and Roa, Arkansas. I was one of those selected by the company commander to go to Roa. I recall that morning we got out and showered and shaved and put on our aftershave lotion, took out our ukuleles because we were looking forward to a grand weekend with Kotonk girls. And I recall just about every moment of the trip was joy and singing until we got to Roa. It's in a valley. And looking out there, we could see row after row of barracks. And we thought there was an army camp there until the convoy turned in. And then we saw, to our horror, that the inmate prisoners 
looked like us. And we were ordered to get off the bus, the trucks, by armed men in American uniforms. Well, I can tell you that it wasn't a happy weekend. But when we got back to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to Camp Shelby, we assembled our squads and our platoons, and we told them of this experience. And to this day, I ask myself the question, would I have volunteered if I were in that camp? And when you think that these men volunteered from behind barbed wires, you know, that's an extraordinary thing. I don't think this has ever occurred in the history of the United States. It didn't take much courage for us in Hawaii to sign up, because it was a thing to do. But to be in a camp, that was something else. That morning, the regiment was formed, and we became brothers, and the rest is history. But there are certain things that occurred during the time in combat that has always had an impact upon me. Well, when we landed in Naples, what I saw was just rubble and devastation. But then we were shipped off to a place called Civita Vecchia, and there we set up tents. And it was my job to look after the camp. Most of the company fellows had gone off to Naples, but I stayed back with a squad to guard the premises. I noticed that up on the hill, a group of men and women always looking down at us, and so I summoned them, and they came down, and they all had cans, a gallon can. And the one who could speak English came up and said, we'd like to work for you. We'll do anything. Do your laundry, we'll clean the place. And you know, I'm a GI. If I can get along without working, that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and so my first question was, quanto costa? How much? And he said, all we want is that garbage. Well, I assumed that they were farmers and they wanted the garbage to feed their pigs. So I said, go ahead. They rushed to the can and began eating. You know, I've never seen starvation like that. That was my first real experience with war, where innocent people are involved. Then the next day, my squad and I were given the opportunity to go to the city. And the first human being to greet me was a little boy. And he says, come, my sister. He was selling his sister. Some were selling their mothers. I have a sister, I have two brothers, and I could never imagine my brother selling my sister, but that was war. They were starving. And that was my introduction to war. But then we had our first battle. And I recall early that morning, before we crossed the line of departure, to get into the attack, I was then an assistant squad leader. I inquired of all the men, what were you thinking about last night? Knowing that this is our first battle and some of us may be killed, some may be injured. 
all 11 of them gave the same answer in a different way. I hope I don't dishonor the family. I hope I don't turn out to become a coward. I hope I don't bring shame to the family or to the nation. I was amazed. I thought my father was the only one who talked like that. <laughs> but here they were, speaking of honor. Well, on that first battle, we lost Ralph Ensming, a captain, who was our first company commander. And I lost my best friend who wanted to be a physician. See, I was in pre-med when I signed up. We had already planned our clinic. I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon, and he was going to be a pediatrician. All the plans were made. But then on the first battle, he was nearly sliced in half. I must confess that I was filled with anger and a, and a feeling of revenge. And I must have been rather cold because from that moment on until 1953, I could not cry. It's a strange thing. I would go to a funeral, I can't cry. Go to a movie, sad movie, I can't cry. My wife, at one point, suggested maybe you should see a psychiatrist. But I felt that this was one of the price of war. Well, battle after battle, Hill 140 and all these other battles, until I was involved in a small battle to take over a farming village. And we noted as we approached the farmhouse that there was a machine gun on the second story and that machine gun kept on firing at us and we could not advance. So by then I was a squad leader. I summoned the bazooka man. I said, bring the bazooka over here. And I fired it right through the window. I had a big blast, rushed into the house. I rushed up the second floor. Two Germans were dead. And one was sitting on the floor. His legs were shattered. He put up his arm, Kamerad, Kamerad. And I approached him slowly. And suddenly, he thrust his hand into his jacket. My Instinct told me immediately that he was going for a gun. And so I slammed my rifle butt to his face, and that was his end. But then his hand flew out, and in his hand were photographs. Photographs of his wife and kids. I didn't understand German. He wanted to tell me that he was a married man, and he had a wife and kid. Well, from that moment on, I looked upon every enemy as being either a son or father or an uncle or lover or brother. He was no longer the enemy. He was a human being. So I went to the chaplain and I said, I don't think I can kill anymore. He says, well... God will forgive you because these people are out to destroy us and we have our responsibilities. So I kept up with my work until we got to France. Someone spoke of the Lost Battalion. That battle took about two weeks. Those two weeks included the attempts by the 36th Division to rescue their own men. When they failed, they called upon us to do the job. And we knew that we were called upon because we were expendable. 
But yet, we welcomed this opportunity because up until then, there were numerous battles after battles, but nothing to grab the imagination of people. We felt this was the opportunity. A battalion of Texans surrounded by troops equivalent to a division. And they're calling upon us to bust through that line. Well, in five days, our casualties numbered 800. And over 250 of them were dead. And I recall the retreat parade that was held two days later when General Dahlquist wanted to personally acknowledge our valor and to thank us for heroism and for rescuing his fellow Texans. When I looked down, I was then a lieutenant. I company had eight men. When you consider a company has 197 officers and men, the company commander was a staff sergeant. Eight men. K Company had 18 men, and the company commander was a buck sergeant. The rest were all injured or dead. And E Company, the company I served in, had the largest number. 42, and we sort of slinked back because we felt that maybe we didn't do our part. We survived so well. The band that usually has about 36 men had about 15 left. It was a strange band with one trombone player, one trumpet player, two drummers, one bass, but the music was glorious. It was then that General Rock was turned to our colonel and said, I ordered you to have the men assembled. You decided to disregard my order. I can understand that when he sees 42 in E Company as the largest contingent, the band with 15 men. Well, he was supposed to have given us a plaque and given a speech. But when he learned that this was the regiment, he found that he could not utter a word. Well, I was then a fresh lieutenant, so my regimental commander called me in and said, we will now go to the south of France to have limited combat duty to replenish our forces, but you'll be the convoy commander. Convoy commander, sir? He says, yes, you'll sit in the first truck, and at certain intervals, you will stop the convoy so that the men can go out and relieve themselves. After all, they can't ride for eight hours on a stretch without stopping. And so I took my job seriously. And when I thought that we were outside the cities, I would call out, and the call was, piss call. <laughs> yeah, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the trucks would all stop, and the men would rush out and go to the trees, the forest. But then a jeep came speeding down, and that was a colonel. What the hell are you doing? I said, sir, this is piss call. <laughs> he says, I know that. Half the regiment's pissing in town. <laughs> First lesson. Well. It was something that I would never forget. In southern France, we were stationed in a place called Nice, a lovely place. 
we call that the champagne campaign. Yes, we did have casualties, but uh, it wasn't too bad. But then we were called back to Italy. This was the Gothic line. The Germans had a breathing time of five months to set up fortifications. The divisions there tried for five months to break the line, but couldn't do it. And I remember when we got there, our regimental commander assembled all the officers and said, now I want you to reconnoiter this area and you find out where the weak spots are and tell me how long it will take to break the line. So we all went out on our reconnaissance patrols, gave our reports. A Couple of days later, the general assembled us, the head of the 92nd Division. It was like a scene in the movie Patton, huge stage, with a flag in the back and the general standing in the middle. Gentlemen, welcome to Italy. We have been here for five months trying to break this line. Your reputation precedes us, and so we are asking you to lead the attack. We hope you can break the line in two weeks. And so the colonel goes up to respond and he says, General, sir, would it mess up your schedule if we did it in 24 hours? <laughs> well, we did it in less than 12 hours because instead of a frontal assault, we went from the side on sheer cliffs. But I still recall the night before when we were told this is not going to be easy, but if you should slip and fall, don't scream. You know, that's a strange order to give. One man did fall, and he did not scream. All you could hear was the thump when it hit the bottom. Well, the attack began at 9 o'clock in the evening, we were up on the top by five o'clock in the morning and we waited and the Germans came out lining up for breakfast and the word was passed down, the captain will fire the first round and after that, happy hunting. Well, we, that company of Germans got demolished and we broke the line. Then a few days later, this was in April of 45, you should keep in mind that just prior to this battle, all of the officers were gathered at each company headquarters. And for the first time, our company commander said, I want you to take an oath of secrecy. I didn't know what oath of secrecy was, but we did. And his message was, I'm going to tell you something, and you're not going to share it with anyone. You're just going to keep it to yourself and conduct yourself accordingly. The war is over. The Germans are now negotiating and discussing, but we must maintain the pressure. And if you tell your men that the war is over, there'll be no pressure, so keep it up. That was a terrible order. Knowing that the war will be over and knowing that all of us wanted to go home. Well, on April 21st, that was my final battle. On that day, I was wounded and sent to the hospital. But there's something happened in the hospital that has always been part of my life. The 92nd Division had a policy in their field hospital that whenever they gave a blood transfusion, and in those days they 
The blood came in bottles instead of plastic bags. On each bottle was a taped tag. Name, rank, serial number, unit. I had 17 transfusions. In fact, the chaplain thought I was ready for confession, and I said, no, I'm not quite ready yet. But 17 transfusions, all from the 92nd Division. And the 92nd Division was made up of African Americans. I had... So when the civil rights legislation came up, I believe I was only the, the only African American in the Senate. <laughs> so I could speak with some, well, reality that I had some African blood in me. But thanks to them, I'm here today. And I'm always grateful to them. Well, my closing remarks of my hospitalization. As I told General Myers, there's one thing I regret. I find myself going to Walter Reed Hospital because that hospital has become the amputee center for army troops. And whenever I get there, they, we have a good time chatting. And it never fails. Somebody would ask me the question, where were you hospitalized? And I would tell them Battle Creek, Michigan, and New Jersey, Atlantic City. How long were you hospitalized? 23 months. Today, a person with similar injury would be out on the street in about seven months. His prosthetic appliance would be the state of the art, the finest that mankind can produce. His medical and surgical treatment is the best in the land. But in Battle Creek, Michigan, I spent my time in rehabilitation. That is what is lacking with the men today, and I'm, and so it saddens me when I go to Walter Reed and these men look at me and say, I think we got shortchanged. I hope we can change that policy. And just to briefly tell you what rehab meant, I had to learn to drive. I never drove a car because of the strict rules in my household. I had to drive and get a license that permitted me to drive in 48 states and, and all the territories. Then I had to learn how to do carpentry. Can you pound a nail with one hand? See, they teach you these things. Electrical work, plumbing, learn to play sports. I did basketball and swimming. I was a failure in golf. First three holes, 92. <laughs> so they looked at me and says, we know you're trying, but uh, <laughs> don't pursue this. Then I was required to take up a musical instrument. I'm a life member of the union because I played in a dance band, but I played a saxophone, and you can't play a saxophone one-handed. And in order to qualify, you had to do it without a drum or harmonica. And so the instructor said, why don't you take up a piano? You know, I passed the test. All these things were done. In fact, as I, some of the men here know, we had one session on how to make love. Just think about it. You know, most of you would laugh and chuckle about this, but the lesson that I got from that professor, 
Some of you have never had a woman in your life, some since your injury. When you do, make certain that she sleeps on your bad side. My bad side? Because it's human nature to try not to expose your disability and your ugly scars to your loved one. So the tendency is to put your loved one on your good side. And as the professor said, if you put your arm around your loved one, you better have educated toes. <laughs> That's serious discussion. <laughs> yep. But like one of the fellows on the film said, on my way home to Hawaii, I had to go through Oakland. I wanted to be presentable to my folks, so I thought I'd get a haircut. I was in full dress uniform with a hook where my right hand was with four rows of ribbons. And when I walked to the, opened the door and walked in, there were four empty chairs. And a barber approached me and he said, are you a Jap? I said, no, I'm an American but my father was born in Japan. We don't cut Jap hair. Well, you know, I was tempted to slice him, <laughs> and I could have done that. But I decided that uh, after all of this, why waste my time here? So I just said, I feel sorry for you. But when I got back in Hawaii, a so-called racial paradise, I was invited to lunch at a very fancy restaurant. And here I am, I'm also in uniform because I was still in the service. And this maitre d' had much difficulty telling me they can't serve me. Well, after having said that, one would think that I ended my career in bitterness, but I want you to know that this is a great country. Yes, we do make mistakes, but as a great country, we acknowledge making mistakes. And when my country apologized, just think about it. How many nations would apologize? This country did. The redress wasn't that important as far as I was concerned, the monetary compensation, but the apology and the acknowledgement, that was something. Well, I serve in a great country. I'm proud to do so. And today I want to thank all the veterans, not just World War II, for all those who have served us, and General Myers, that includes you, because if it weren't for the veterans, I don't think this nation would be as great as it is today. So to all of you, thank you very much. God bless America. Thank you so much, Senator, for sharing your story. So we're, we're almost at the end here, and um, what I want to do is I want to acknowledge um, the, the people who made this possible. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the, the two prime sponsors of, of this event, uh, the Boeing Company and the Seattle Nisei Veterans Committee. 
that without their financial support, this would not have been possible. In addition to that, I want to also acknowledge the, well, there, there were, and there were about a dozen other, uh, other sponsors, but I want to move on and, and acknowledge also the, the volunteers. To put an event like this on took about 80 volunteers. Uh, there was an advisory committee, there were volunteers who were going to help with the, uh, the post-event reception, the planning, everything, um, and wanted to acknowledge all of them. And in particular, I want to acknowledge one volunteer who produced these, these lovely uh, programs. And I'm sure you, you all have seen this, you all received it when you walked in. But this uh, was uh, done by Sharon Nakamura, who's uh, in the audience, and I want to thank Sharon for this. <laughs> and, and Sharon also created these wonderful medals for uh, each of the men on stage. These are uh, for World War II Japanese American veterans. And you'll see them out in the uh, lobby during the uh, the uh, reception. So take a look at it. If someone's wearing it, that means that they're a, a World War II veteran. Um, and in addition, I want to just uh, acknowledge some of the people uh, in this room. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge U.S. Representative Jay Inslee. Um, and just a note, he sponsored the bill to, to um, have a memorial on Bainbridge Island uh, to become part of the National Park Service. Uh, we also have from the military, Major General Lawrence Johnson, Commanding General of the 70th Readiness Command. Major General Rodney Kobayashi, 91st Division Commander. Rear Admiral Richard Hook, Commander, 13th Coast Guard District. Brigadier General Gordon D. Tony, Assistant Adjunct General, Washington Military Department. Brigadier General Oscar Hillman, Special Assistant to I Corps, uh, Commanding General. Uh, Captain Eddie Gardner, Commander of the Naval Station Everett. Colonel P.K. White, U.S. Air Force, UW Air Force ROTC. Colonel Stephen Arkiet, Vice Commander, 62nd Airlift Wing, McCord Air Force Base. Lieutenant Colonel Bill Leedy, USA, um, UW Army ROTC. Commander David Neely, US Navy, Navy ROTC. Major Tim Pokechop, US uh, Marine Corps, US UW Navy ROTC. Major Tom Gravely, USA, UW Army ROTC. Captain Bill Pastewaite, U.S. Air Force, UW Air Force ROTC. And then we also have uh, the Japanese Consul General Tanaka and his wife also in the audience. From the uh, state, we have Representative Ed Murray, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos, and Representative Bob Hasegawa. And from the city, we have City City Council President Jan Drago, Council Memberman Richard Conlin, Council Member David Della, and Council Member Tom Rasmussen, and from the King County, we have King County Council Member Dow Constantine. We also have, uh, uh, joining the governor, Mike Gregoire, um, the first gentleman of the state of Washington, who's also a, a U.S. Army veteran. And then our host uh, at the University of Washington, we have Dr. Mark Emmert, president of the University of Washington, uh, who uh, was at dinner last night at, at, at Scott's, Scott Oakey's, who is the next person I want to introduce. Uh, the chairman of Den Show, um, Scott Oakey, um, nine years ago, Scott and I had a conversation. Uh, he had a vision for Den Show nine years ago, and he was the one who inspired me to, to take on this challenge. And when I decided to take it on, he was very generous in his support to, to make this all happen. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Scott Oakey. It is truly hard to believe that it's been nine years. Um, and nine years ago, no, I wasn't 21, nor did I weigh 120 pounds. Uh, Dencho truly was a, just a vague idea. Um, but it was inspired by what Sp uh, Steven Spielberg uh, was doing with the Shoah Foundation to record the horrors of the Holocaust. We were determined to preserve and make universally available the untold stories of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. The original idea was to try to digitally record interviews um, and create a very rich archive of oral histories with all of these survivors in the first person and to attempt to preserve as many salient yet different points of view as possible. As it turned out, the stories of Japanese-American World War II veterans 
were of particular interest because they told us of the incredible sacrifices that were made to win the war. Many of these men volunteered from behind barbed wire to serve our country with distinction and honor while their families remained prisoners in the camps. More than 650 never came home. Those who did helped build America in the post-war era. Our community and nation owe a huge debt to these men. I'd like to thank Senator Inouye for making the long trip to this Washington from the other Washington. You are loved and admired by the Nikkei community. You put a face on the many sacrifices that have been made by all veterans. Senator, you are indeed our living national treasure. <laughs> General Myers, I'd also like to thank you and your lovely bride, Mary Jo, uh, for also making that coast-to-coast -coast trip. Your tribute to these veterans was heartfelt and very much appreciated. Thank you. And Governor Gregoire, we are delighted and honored that you have chosen to actually be with us here today. You have many things you could do. You're here with, with us today, and it is, is meaningful. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask all the veterans on this stage to please stand. And will you all join me in an all too infrequent recognition of appreciation that all these humble, yet very prideful men have done. Thank you. And lastly, uh, as I turn the mic back over to Tommy Ketta, um, I would really like to thank Tom for the incredible leadership that he has provided for Densho. Densho would not exist without his dedicated volunteer service. Tom, we are indebted to you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. Uh, following the event or following this, this program, we now have a reception out in the lobby. So please go out there. We're going to have the veterans come through the green room. So they're going to go uh, backstage to the green room. And you can meet them uh, outside the green room um, after uh, this program. So again, thank you so much for coming.